the sacrament of the cross. The sacrament of the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Greg Homing. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and Holy Spirit. This, then, is what I pray, kneeling before the Father, from whom every family, whether spiritual or natural, takes its name. Out of his infinite glory, may he give you the power through his Spirit for your hidden self to grow strong, so that Christ may live in your hearts through faith, and then planted in love and built on love, you will, with all the saints, have strength to grasp the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, until knowing the love of Christ, which is beyond all knowledge, you are filled with the utter fullness of God. Glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Yesterday, I, in my small talk, one of the things that I was trying to emphasize was the close relationship, in fact, not simply close relationship, the oneness between the cross and the love of Christ. Because for Christians, that symbol of the cross, which for anyone else is a sign of torture a sign of distress, a sign of pain. For us, this is a sign of love. It's worth pondering all the time, I think, that close relationship between the cross and love. Because unless that relationship is somehow part of our experience at times, or at least our reflection in hindsight, unless we can make the link between the cross and love, the cross is always a dead end, and we are only mouthing religious flippancies to speak of the cross as being somehow something salvific. Because I, I think one of the big issues and problems in the contemporary church, both in New Zealand and Australia, and indeed in most first world countries, is that so much of what is preached seems to have no connection with life, especially for the young. It seems to be the mouthing of accepted and acknowledged religious truths which are mouthed again and again and again, and are mouthed so much, spoken so much, that they very often lose their meaning, they lose their content. It's not that what's said is not true, but a truth said without the appreciation of what is behind it, a truth spoken which is divorced from any kind of human experience, becomes what St. Teresa would say, something for the angels. And she would say quite strongly, I'm not an angel, and what is for an angel is of no use to me. Remember that the Eucharist is given not to the angels, but to human beings. We don't have angels queuing up to receive the Eucharist. They're different. And we have to be ensure that whatever we speak about in terms of our faith and what it is to be Catholics must be firmly grounded in what it is to be human because a faith which is not grounded in our humanity is a disembodied faith. And that's not what we're about. We're about an embodied faith because God became a human being, the wonderful embodiment of the Incarnation. So today I, I want to, in a way, move on slightly from where we were yesterday. So if you weren't here yesterday, that might mean that you'll have to go and buy whatever it is that people are selling from, from what happened yesterday. This is not a plug for my thing because I'm not getting a commission, so don't worry. <laughs> but I left you yesterday with, with that sense of the great giftedness of Christ as he died on the cross was the gift of not having and the, the problem with so many of the others who were around the cross and which stopped them from being drawn into the reality of the cross at that time was the fact that they held on to too much. 
I didn't give you the chance to ask me questions, but I'm sure that someone would have asked the, the proper question, which should have been asked to what I said yesterday. And that question is simply this. Why were they holding on to things? I gave you pointers as to how to let go of things, but we need to look at why it is that we hold on to things. And the answer very simply is, I hold on to something because I want it. What I don't want, I don't hold on to. This morning, I decided, I woke up at Carmel and they were having their mass and I was going to be here for mass. So I thought, what will I do after I'd said my prayers? And so I'll go for a walk. And I walked up the road and I thought, I have no idea what's happened in the world recently. I'll buy a newspaper. And I went to buy the weekend newspaper and you know, it, like in Australia, it's so thick. And I thought, I don't want to carry all of this back to the Carmelite monastery. So I asked the lady very kindly, can I leave behind what I don't want? And she said, yes, that's fine. So I left behind three quarters of the newspaper. <laughs> I didn't carry it because I didn't want it. But the parts that I wanted, I carried back to the Carmelite monastery. What we have, what we hold on to, is determined by what we desire. And at the core of the struggle in the spiritual life, as the great spiritual writers, in particular the Carmelite writers, and indeed Jesus Christ tells us, is at the core of so much is what I desire. You know, Jesus speaking, I forget which gospel it is because I'm not a scripture scholar, remember how he says to someone, you can commit adultery in your heart. That should challenge everybody here. All, there are many religious and priests here who are, who are living a life of chastity and celibacy. But Jesus would have to ask each of us, have you committed adultery in your heart? Not only adultery, have you robbed somebody in your heart? Have you, have you slandered somebody in your heart? Because so much of what is about the path of perfection in the spiritual life is not about not doing things wrong, but having a humble, contrite heart which is spoken of in the Old Testament. And this is what is asked of us. And so you can look at the Holy Carmelites down there in, on Mount Albert Road and think, well, they don't have a chance to do anything wrong. Well, no. They can sin gravely in their hearts. And this is what Jesus says in that Gospel passage, which nobody preaches about. And I don't know why, because to me, that is one of the core passages about following Christ. Because I don't follow Christ by walking behind the cross, but I follow Christ by trying to purify. Well, I can't purify, but inviting Him to purify and cleanse my heart, which is caught up in every one of the seven deadly sins. And if we're honest, it's true of each of us. St. Teresa knew this so well. She writes in the second mansions of the interior castles. When I was pondering the things of God, my heart kept on going back to the things of the world. And when I was in the world, my heart kept on going back to God. St. Paul knew this very well too, because he speaks of the flesh being weak. And we experience this, all of us, in our lives. And at the core of our cross, the reason that we can have a cross is because our desires are not about Christ, but about ourselves. That means that everyone from the person who seems to be a public sinner to the person who seems to be publicly a saint, every person suffers because at the core of their life are desires which are not about God. If, for example, I was not interested in what people thought about me, I wouldn't be bothered if someone slighted me. If I didn't want things, I wouldn't notice what people had that I didn't have. If knowing things weren't important, I wouldn't be interested when someone knew something that I didn't know, would I? And there then is the core, so much of what takes me away from God. Not what I find outside myself, 
but quite simply those things which draw me in this direction and that direction within myself, these things which the great mystics and great saints in the spiritual life speak of as desires. The spiritual life, then, is the ordering of these desires. The cross that everyone carries is intimately linked with those desires. People who suffer great hurt suffer great hurt because they can be hurt. And they are hurt because something which they want or expected was not there. And if they didn't want or expect that, they wouldn't be hurt. I spend a lot of time with people who are suffering extraordinary things which are embedded in their memories. The cleansing of memories. The cleansing of memories is a lifelong event for many people. And what is the problem? Why can't they let go of their memories? Is because their desires force them to hold on to their memories. Because who I am is made up of the way my desires unfold and take their place within my life. The cross then, which each of us carries, to put it very simply, is not something which is given to me externally, but the cross which I must carry is the cross which is the man that I am. Until we can see this truth, we won't even begin to be able to ponder and carry our cross in a way which is salvific, in a way which leads to holiness. You know, there's no avoiding the cross because Jesus says in St. Luke's Gospel, if you want to be my disciple, what do you have to do? You must daily take up your cross and follow me. So the Christian whose life is about the avoidance of the cross is the one whose life is about the avoidance of Christ. But that said, the question now for us is, how do I find my cross to pick it up? Okay? It's, it's what is very strongly there in the Gospels. In St. Mark's Gospel, the following of Christ's discipleship, which in St. Mark's Gospel, he says, if you want to follow Christ, you must go to Calvary with him. I much prefer the way St. Luke puts it because it taps into my daily life. Every day, if I wish to live a life, and the rule of Carmel says, to live a life of allegiance to Jesus Christ, sequela Jesu Christi, a, a life of following Christ, I can only follow if every day I can find the cross which is being given to me and carry it. Now, where is that cross? It would be very strange if my cross was to find Mount Everest and to climb it. And yet so many of us seek our cross in difficult places, in places here, there and everywhere. Those of you who are religious, your temptation is to seek your cross outside of your community. And you will run and you will work hard all over the place doing the work of God but you will not want to be with your brothers and sisters in your community. Same thing in families too. People will run from the family to serve God. It's the most bizarre thing to think about, to run away from where God is loving you so as to love God. The place of the cross invariably consists to the largest part of where I find myself. And that's given to us in our Carmelite spirituality very strongly by St. Teresa of Avila, who in the great work, the book of her life, which incidentally was the last straw on the camel's back for St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, otherwise known as Edith Stein, a convert from Orthodox Judaism who became an atheist and then became a Catholic and joined the Carmelites. She became a Catholic because she, worked, she read in one sitting the autobiography well, only takes us to 1562 in Teresa's life, who died in 1582. Um, but still, nevertheless, it, it, it covers a large part of her life. She read this book. Now, one part of that book, she says, a beautiful passage. 
We are always in the presence of God, but the manner is different for the one who prays, because that person is aware of the fact and looks back at the God who is looking at them. Very beautiful passage. We're always in the presence of God. What does that mean? You just have to read St. John's first letter to know what that must mean. Because in St. John's first letter, he says, God is love. That's a very powerful statement. It's not really telling me who God is so much as telling me what God does. Because if God is love, God can only love. Okay? But if God, if St. John had said, God loves, we would say, so what? We all know that. But in the Old Testament, they thought God loves and God punishes. St. John the Evangelist comes along and gives us the coup de grace. God is love. And that means God can only love. Because if God ever stopped loving, he wouldn't be God. Okay? I was taught that, as I've told some of you when I've been speaking in, in New Zealand as well. I went to a, a, when I was in primary school, I was in a, in a little country town in Australia. And I had Mercy sisters teaching me. And one of the sisters, Sister Eileen, said... If God stopped loving you, you wouldn't be here anymore. You wouldn't exist. You'd vanish. And I can remember as a six-year-old making the sign of the cross. And I said a prayer and I said to God, I said, Dear Jesus, stop loving Sister Eileen just for five seconds. So, <laughs> so that I could see her vanish. <laughs> and nothing happened. So I... I I waited a while and I said the same prayer again and she didn't vanish. I just presumed, yes, even though I've asked, God's not going to stop loving Sister Eileen. Even though I said, look, you, you, you can bring her back. I just want to see it happen. <laughs> but there was an extraordinary truth. I tend to think I was probably the only little boy in the class that did that. But I, I was so impressed by what, what Sister said. But that's straight from John's letter. God is love which means God can't do anything but love. And when we think God can do something other than love, what we're thinking about is not God. It's not God. That means that whatever is happening to me, at any moment in my life, I am being loved by God. That's a truism. And yet so few people live by it. Because most people, when things aren't the way they want them to be, wonder why and think, what must I do to make God love me? What must I do? They think, I must change my life. In fact, I don't have to change my life to be loved by God. I have to change my life to become a fuller person, to be richly divine, to become like Christ. I must change my life. But to be loved by God, I don't have to do anything. Because while I was in sin, he sent his son to die for me. Well, not even that, even before I was born, he sent his son to die for all of us. So, the simple truism is, I am loved by God now. And to live the Christian life means to live from that truth now. And St. Teresa puts it most beautifully. Because when she speaks about it, she says in the Spanish, the Spanish word there when she says that we are, to, to pray is to be aware that God is looking at me. The word in the Spanish is miro. Now, when Father Otilio Rodriguez and Kieran Kavanagh translated that into English, they used the word look, which is different to seeing. Because if I can see you, it doesn't mean you can see me. But if I'm looking at you, it means that if you'll open your eyes, you'll see me looking at me and you can look back at me. That was what they were trying to capture. But that doesn't even capture what St. Teresa of Avila is trying to say. The word miro, etymologically, is linked with the English word to admire, which is admiro, which is to look at. And in the etymological sense, coming from those Latin roots through the Spanish, when St. Teresa says God is looking at us, St. Teresa means God is admiring and delighting in us. As it is given to us in Genesis, God saw all that he had made and indeed it was very good. Which as St. John of the Cross tells us means that God looked at what he made and he delighted in it and he enjoyed it. It's peculiar that God shouldn't enjoy what he made. If you were the best cook in the world, I imagine you would enjoy your cooking. 
if you're the worst cook in the world, you cook for somebody and you'll go out and buy something else for yourself to eat. <laughs> but if you were the best cook in the world, you wouldn't buy somebody else's cooking, you'd eat your own cooking, wouldn't you? God is the best creator, he's the only creator. So of course everything he made is wonderful. And God enjoys and delights in everything he made. You know, this is not a boast. But if Jesus had stood here, rather than, I think it was Philip who, 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 who introduced all of the speakers, how would Jesus have introduced the speakers? He would have said, the next speaker is Greg, and I want to tell you, he is one of my closest friends, my dear friend that I love very much. And that's the truth. That's how Jesus would introduce anybody That is what it means when we say God looks at us. Because God looks at me and delights in everything which I am and says to you, that's my best friend. There's nobody that I want to be with more than Greg. And he says that of each of you. Because that's what it means to say God loves me perfectly. Even when I'm in sin, he loves me that much that he'll leave all of you 99 sheep to be gobbled up by wolves because there's no one to look after them to go and look for me. He's, he so loves me that when, even when I'm in sin, he doesn't notice all of you who are not sinning. In fact, he'll leave you here for the wolves and the brigands to come and take away because he wants me back. That's the extraordinary love that the gospel gives us of Jesus Christ. So let's come now to our crosses which, as I said, are intimately connected with my desires. I have crosses because I have disordered desires. If my desires were simply about love of God, love of my neighbour and authentic love of myself, there is no cross that would come my way which wouldn't be about God. But the problem is, as things happen in my life, they impinge upon me selfishly, don't they? So, that's where jealousy comes in, isn't it? If your cross is a link with your jealousy and you're always noticing what other people have and what they're doing and you're thinking, what about me? At the core of that is jealousy and behind jealousy is you want things for yourself and you feel hurt when you don't have things for yourself and it all taps into what jealousy is about. If your cross has got to do with controlling things and not having things your own way, it's because you want things your way. And when things are not your own way, it doesn't matter who it is, it could be Father saying, Mass the wrong way, not the way you want it. I often say to people who come to me because I'm a Carmelite and complain to me about the way Masses are and the way things are, and I often get to the point, what's behind it really? Is it about God or is it about your own preference? Because if it's about your preference and you're getting angry, then it's about you. And this is about sin and this is about your cross. Do you see what I'm saying? So much is something which we presume is other than what it is. Why is it that I can not have the gentleness, which is the gift of the fruit of the Spirit? Why is it that I, that I can be impatient? Why is it that I can be intolerant? Why is it that I can be envious? Why is it that I can be angry? Because of something within myself. And that indeed is at the core of all the crosses that I carry. Because I know people who suffer great pain and yet that doesn't impact upon their life. Because their desires are about something else. And where their desires are is where they go. And if my desire was simply about Christ, that's where I would go. And if your desires are such that they're not about Christ, they take them into yourself. And you'll find, yes, there are many crosses. Now, these crosses are things which we often bring to confession, aren't they? And we say, Father, I wish that it wasn't like this. I'm sorry about this. I've said these things. I've done these things. I wish that it wasn't. And my answer to them always is, Try your best, but it will be the same. Why? Because in your experience of yourself and your experience of your desire, God loves you. Which means God 
has nothing against the makeup and the balance of your desires within you. But what you have to be careful about is what you do with them. There's a, there, there is, there is a, an infinite difference between the kind of man that I am and what I allow the kind of man that I am to make me by what I do. Because my experience of myself is so often of someone who wants to do things but can't, who wants to avoid things but doesn't, who wants to love but can't love. All these things which we experience about ourselves. But the real question is not how I experience of myself and how it seems to me. The real question is, but how does this seem to Jesus Christ? Because if I focus simply on how it seems to me, I'm falling again into the selfishness, which in fact is what leads to sin. So the question is not how does this seem to me, but how does it appear to Christ? And I can tell you how it appears to Christ. It doesn't bother him in the slightest, so long as I don't sin. All of these things which I experience within myself, which many of us speak of as temptations, don't bother Christ, for he was tempted himself. They don't bother him. Hands up anyone here is over the age of 80. Come on, be honest. <laughs> now, if our Lord had said, as you might be saying, I can't seem to change myself, I'm ashamed and I'm annoyed with myself, if he'd been annoyed with you, I, I'm sure within 80 years he would have struck you down dead by now and stopped thinking of you. <laughs> but he hasn't stopped loving you because that's why you're still here. And if our Lord had really wanted to change you, he would have changed you. But everything which I am except my sin is the way he made me. And I am that way because it's the way he loves me. Notice what happened to St. Peter. He remained the man that he is. He denied the Lord. And I don't believe he ever changed. But from the depth of the cross that he carried, from the crucifixion of Christ until he saw him by the lake of Tiberias in chapter 21 of John's Gospel, from the period from the denial until the Lord spoke to him, he carried deeply within himself the wound of his betrayal. The greatest cross Peter ever carried was not his own crucifixion, but the cross of his betrayal which he carried. What that man must have suffered within himself as he saw his beloved Lord die on the cross and the last thing the Lord ever heard him say was, I don't know him. And that experience of his own cross, through his own weakness and desires, opened up within Peter an extraordinary channel into his soul. It broke open his soul. It became a wound, as we speak of in our Carmelite spirituality. And when our Lord looked into his eyes at that wonderful breakfast and said to Peter, do you love me? He wasn't asking Peter whether he loved him. But Peter could see from Jesus' eyes that Jesus knew that Peter loved him. And Peter was only saying to Jesus what he knew Jesus knew. Lord, I know that you know I love you because I can see in your eyes that even in spite of what has happened, I can see in your eyes that you love me and I can see in your eyes that you know that I love you. Do you see, love always is what? It's not only that I want to love you and want you to love me, but I want to know from you that you know that I love you. And this is what happens with Peter, but it only happened because he carried the cross of who he is, never wavering from his desire for Christ. And the Lord came and looked into his eyes and went to the very place where he was suffering his own cross. So St. Teresa tells us, towards the end of the second mansions of the interior castles, the Lord desires that we have thoughts 
that we're not able to get rid of. It's a wonderful thing. She says she desires that we have tempta- God desires that we have temptations that we can't get rid of. It's the very it's one of the very high points of the spiritual life in the fifth mansions, which is what we come and like, speak of as mystical spirituality. St. Teresa says, it is good at these very high parts of the spiritual life that we are tempted, because temptations, notice this is in the very high parts of the spiritual life, temptations are good for us, which is the experience of my weakness hammering in upon me only leads me to a greater truth of who I am. You see, there's a difference between being tempted and being tempted and sinning. It is our human condition, as we know ourselves, that I am tempted and I sin. But if I'm smart, I will learn from my sin. It's what I say to the people that come to my youth group in Sydney about sin and temptation, two things. If you're going to sin, for God's sake, enjoy it, because if you don't, why? It's not a silly thing, because so often we sin and there's no enjoyment in it. So why? These are very obvious questions that nobody ever asks. Everyone presumes that sin must be enjoyable. But I can't remember the last time I did something wrong which was enjoyable. Can you? So why? It's a good question, and if you ponder it, you'll learn something about yourself, about your lack of freedom, which is what sin is about. The other thing is, if you do sin, for God's sake, learn from your sin how better to love God. And if you do, then in a peculiar sense, it was worth your while sinning. Because the devil's got you to sin, but God has got you to to become a better person as a consequence, and he's getting very angry about that. And that, in fact, is the way that we go forward, isn't it? We do something wrong and we learn from it because grace and the love of Christ is greater than sin. Now, when we see it that way, it means that even in the midst of my cross and my falls with my cross, God is stronger and the love of Christ nevertheless abounds and all I have to do is make sure that I do not stop trying. St. Teresa says very powerfully, our Lord pays no attention to your sins. Obviously not, because if you ask, you'll forgive them. So then no concern to him. They don't stop him loving you. Nor does he pay any attention to the way that you have failed in your good intentions. Thank God for that. The only thing he is concerned about and the thing which gives him the greatest pleasure is that you keep persevering, that you don't give up. And so, what then is the cross? The cross is me and my struggle not to give up. I'm a discalced Carmelite and people look at people like me because I wear this brown thing and they think that I'm holy. I find it kind of because of that I'd much rather not wear my habit so you wouldn't think I was holy because you've as a consequence, people think false things about us. People ask me, you know, what do you know about Jesus Christ? I think this is a holy man. What's your experience of Jesus Christ? In fact, precious little, to be honest. But the only thing that I do know about Jesus Christ is he has not, and I'm quite sure that he never will give up on me because in spite of all things, he has always forgiven me and always been there for me. That is the one thing that I know about Jesus. I suppose it's a good thing to know. I'm sure most of you know that also. Now, today we celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, I'm a discalced Carmelite and I have nothing against Divine Mercy, but for me, I, I don't see the point of it because it's something which the Carmelites have been teaching for the last 800 years. And it's a simple truth, and that is, what is our experience of God? It is exactly what is in the Gospels. Everyone who met Jesus Christ experienced what? Don't worry, I love you, I forgive you. 
and they experienced him because they were carrying the cross of their sinfulness. And those who didn't think they were sinners never met him. Never met him. The Pharisees never met him because they thought they weren't sinners. You know, our cross, which is that by which we fall, that which, which we struggle with, which is at the core grounded in our disordered desires, in fact is, in terms of the gospel, our passport to meeting Jesus. Our passport is not our virtue, our holiness, no. I meet Jesus because I'm a sinner. I came not for the well, but for the sick. I came not to call the virtuous, but the sinner. It's most wonderful. I couldn't be anything but a Christian. And only in so far as I know my sinfulness. That doesn't mean only in so far as I know how I'm sinning. Because we can experience our sinfulness and not sin. Which is the next step after experiencing our sinfulness and sinning. See, I experience my cross through my desires by experiencing temptations. Some of which I give in to. Until I learn to experience that there's nothing wrong with experiencing temptations and inclinations to things which are ungodly, because that's what it is to be born <laughs> in fallen nature. And there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, there's nothing scary about it either. You fast sometimes, don't you? So what? I'm hungry, so what? It doesn't stop me from doing things. But if I focus on the fact that I'm hungry, I'll go into convulsions and break out in a sweat and fall down and say, I'm hungry. But if I simply carry my hungriness, it doesn't stop anything. I cut my finger. If I walk around saying I've got a sore thumb all day, I won't be able to do anything. But if I go about doing my work, the pain doesn't go away, but it doesn't bother me. My weaknesses are there. If I focus on them, I've got a problem but I must learn to carry them with our Lord, which means is simply to experience them and to live in them, because this is the truth of who I am. My good points and my bad points are really neither good nor bad. They are indifferent. They are about the person that I am. They are bad if I allow them to take me away from Christ, and my good points will do that through pride. They are good if through them they allow me to come to Christ, which means that I allow Christ to break through to me in my so-called good and bad points, which, as I said, are really indifferent. And in terms of this aspect of the cross, the Lord comes through to me through my crosses. In fact, I don't believe he comes to me intimately in, in any other way. Because for St. Teresa, the sine qua non for the spiritual life, that which is necessary at every part of my spiritual life, is the virtue of humility, which I don't have, but I grow in. And I grow in how? By living more honestly the truth of the man that I am and realizing and experiencing in that the love of Christ, which is the forgiving love of Christ, the forgiving love. That is the church teaching, but it has to be put that way. What love do I seek? that love which is the forgiving love of Christ, which is why St. Therese said, every time I found a new fault, I was excited. <laughs> why? Because there would be a new way in which I would experience the love of God. Because it is through this that Christ comes into my life. He comes in through my weakness and breaks into me. So, there is indeed a sacramental nature to my weakness, to my sinfulness. And indeed, so powerful is the love of God that my sin can never overcome the light of Christ. The light of Christ, we are told last week in the Exalted, O night of nights when earth is joined to heaven, Father, we offer you this our Easter offering, this candle. May the morning star that never fades still find this candle burning brightly. The Easter candle which we have is a symbol of light, of the light of Christ coming into not the darkness of the world, 
I don't know what the darkness of the world is. When I talk about it, I'm judging the world. I don't know what the darkness, I don't know what your darkness is, but I know what mine is. And this light of Christ comes into my darkness. And it is only because I have darkness that the light of Christ comes to me. And it's only because I have darkness that the light of Christ is beautiful. And it's only by entering into my darkness and waiting and searching and struggling that the light can come in. And when it does, it is beautiful. And in my darkness and in your darkness, we, we, we don't try to leave the darkness anymore because the light is there. And in that darkness, we remain, we pray, we love, and we look upon Christ who is the light of our lives. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.